Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, thank you for tuning in for Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith of Country Roads Magazine. In the world of large-scale sculpture, Louisiana lost a giant in 2021 when Lim Emery passed away at the age of 94. Emery's sculptures were acclaimed worldwide for the way that they harness kinetic energy, seemingly defying gravity, to make movement seem effortless. Her sculptures, which reflect the forces of nature, earned Emery a worldwide following. We had an opportunity to speak with the artist and also one of her most learned devotees, Elizabeth Weinstein. <music> Lynn Emery is an internationally recognized sculptress. She was originally from New York, but she moved to New Orleans in the 1950s. Lynn went to Paris at an early point in her career. She was actually pursuing journalism at the time and entered the studio of a Russian sculptor named Asip Zadking. I just happened to live across the street from his studio and went in to see what it was about and he was teaching advanced sculptors and he took me in simply to show them how to treat a neophyte that knew nothing about sculpture and he was very cruel to women he didn't like women but he let me stay and i got fascinated with the clay after a while, when he saw how serious I was, he let me sharpen his carving tools. She was there for only about eight months, but it was long enough for her to find her calling. She worked there in clay and in bronze, and he was very rigorous. Every week we had a nude model, and we made a life-size figure of clay, and then on Friday, we destroyed it and started a new one the following Monday. Lynn Emery began making sculpture at a time when very few women were artists who could show their work, especially sculptural work. She enjoyed New Orleans a great deal and decided to make that her home base in large part because the city was more accepting of female artists. New Orleans had a history of the Newcomb College and artists such as Angela Gregory, who's a sculptress who was getting commissions, such as for our state capitol. I started making my own sculpture and discovered that since I knew how to do figures, I could do over life-size figures. So I did the saints for all the churches in this area. Doing the life-size figures, they had to have an inner support. And first I just used wood, then I learned that it had to be more stable than that. And I needed to learn how to weld to make structures that would hold the clay. And I went to what was then called Delgado, and they wouldn't accept me because they said they had no women's bathrooms. So I went to New York to learn how to weld, and that's how I got into welding. And then I became much more interested in the welding and the steel structures. But when I went to the welding school in New York, there was all men and they thought I was some sort of a social spy, seeing if they were qualified to do this. For the last six decades, she's been making 
beautiful kinetic art pieces that are very unique. They're all over our state, even as far away as Singapore and China. Even her very early works look as if they're moving. They look like they want to take flight. And in fact, flight is a title that she's used for a number of her works throughout her career. When I was in Paris, 11th and 12th century sculptures on the face of the churches, they all looked as though they were moving. Their drapery was swung open. And so when I came back and started doing the saints, I also posed them as if they were moving or doing something. And so it was simply a visual interest in wishing that I could make things move. She started off making kinetic work after the thought struck her while she was washing dishes and noticed a spoon balanced on the edge of a cup. And as the water would kind of plop down into the spoon and it would rock back and forth, she got the idea of making kinetic work. They were largely fairly small, and over time she began to make them larger and more sophisticated. Around this time that she was embarking upon her aquamobiles, she met Isamu Noguchi, who's a very famous Japanese-American sculptor. He was in town working on a commissioned piece that likewise involved water and through him she learned to have a much stronger regard for nature. A lot of her aesthetic philosophy took shape after she met Noguchi. They became lifelong friends. Noguchi is known for his works in gardens and parks and settings such as that. A number of them involve water and natural elements and the first forms of nature began to appear in her work. Her first major fountain commission was a memorial piece to Mayor Morrison, and it involved a type of pump that is prevalent in Japanese gardens called the deer chaser, where the water will fill up in a little part, and then once the water fills, it begins to rock and move. You can see some of that in the fountain piece that we have on display. She studied hydraulics even at Tulane University to try to learn more about how to fashion the pumps in the larger fountain pieces. After the success of the Morrison Fountain, she received a number of other commissions from hospitals and universities and made a large number of them across the country in the 60s and 70s even into the early 80s. But fountain works can have problems. Pumps can break. Ice can make the water freeze. Over time, she decided that it was really too taxing to make kinetic art using water and began to investigate other notions and came across the thought of using magnets while looking at some trade publications. The magnets have a turntable embedded inside that has magnets on it and then magnetic pieces on some of her forms and that causes them to move when they interact you know, through the magnetic force. The wind works, we have put fans on them. Some of them are displayed on turntables in the gallery but if they were outside then the wind would power them. All along her goal has been to make kinetic art that moves in as lifelike a manner as possible, that are not simple machines, but harness nature to become more animated by natural forces. We have musical works and works that you can push a button and then see them open or close or they'll make a musical note. It's another aspect of her work. Lynn has always been very interested in theater and early on actually made sets for television and for theater. And that, that interest in theater and in play has never left her. She begins with the design work, coming up with her ideas. She doesn't draw with pencil and paper like other artists. She makes 3D models. She'll start with like paper and straws and then 
begins to make them a little bit more sophisticated, identifying patterns and pieces, and she decides how she wants them to move. Initially, I believe she did all of it herself. At this point, she does have assistants who help to cut and weld the metal together. She's still designing, she's still making new pieces. The 20-foot piece that we have here was made in her studio. She's really pushed the boundaries of what kinetic art can be. Her work combines art and design and engineering and nature all in, all in one. I think the, the nature element is something that I think is very unique about her work. Because of her reflective surfaces, not only is she harnessing nature, but they become one with nature when they're in the environment, which is part of her unique voice. Perhaps because she is in New Orleans, in Louisiana, not in a center such as New York, she's flown a slightly under the radar, but I think her star is still rising. That's my proudest achievement that just, just came. It says, Lifetime Achievement Award, Kinetic Art Association. So as a kinetic artist, I have a lifetime achievement.